Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to be looking at the theory of evolution as a continuation of uh, what we started last week. But before I begin to look at uh, the theory of evolution, um, I want to address a comment that was left uh, for me on YouTube in response to my first talk. Um, this individual said that I left a sad, sad trail of wrongness and near comical wrongness in the video. And he said that I stated that new atheism started in the early 70s and he or she uh, would like an opportunity to correct this uh, colossal mess that I made. Um, if you review the video, you will see that I had mentioned nothing about the 70s. The only thing about the 70s that has any significance to me is the fact that my family and I immigrated to Canada at that time. Um, I am really quite grateful though for this comment because it has alerted me to the fact that I need to be giving you references, that I am not pulling this information out of my head. I, um, I have been for the past 10 years reading very extensively about um, atheism and theism and watching uh, the debates very, very closely. So everything that I share with you um, is, is, uh, comes from reference books and debates that are available for everyone to, uh, to look at. But I am happy that this happened because um, I will be referencing everything that I talk about. The purpose for these talks is to present uh, to uh, the listener the information in a summarized fashion because most people will not sit and read the amount of books that I read. Um, and to help them uh, understand what is happening in the debate so they can make informed decisions and not just accepting what people say to them blindly. Um, the fact that this new atheism started with 9-11, so here are the references. In 2004, Harris wrote The End of Faith. In 2006, Richard wrote The God Delusion, a very significant book in the debate. Dennett wrote Breaking the Spell, and of course, a very important voice, Christopher Hitchens, wrote, God is not great. As the result of 9-11 attacks, the so-called new atheism movement was born and atheists began to be very vocal. We also read um, in John Lennox's book, Gunning for God, John Lennox is um, a pillar in this debate, a very important voice to be paying very close attention to he asked why the aggression, why are the new atheists, atheists so aggressive? And he shares with us that without the attacks on New York and Washington, there would be no new atheism. Um, in a later interview with the magazine, Dawkins himself said that 9-11 radicalized him. So uh, the very interesting fact, however, is that even though 9-11 um, was the catalyst behind this whole new very aggressive fundamentalist movement, they don't um, have an issue with Islam. Uh, their, their issue is specifically with the God of the Bible. Um, again, the most important question any human being can ask is, does God exist? Because the answer to this question will determine a person's worldview. And a person's worldview drives how a person lives, the quality of life that he, he or she has the decisions that he makes, the moral stands that he takes, how he functions as an individual in society. So my aim today is to discuss with you um, evolution. We want to take a look very quickly again at the difference between uh, micro and macro evolution. We want to get a clear understanding of the mechanism of evolution that is called natural selection then we need to take a look at the evidence for this type of evolution that um, is being taught. And now we, and also finally, we want to look at what the science books have to teach about this topic. The references that I am using, uh, sorry, uh, come from four uh, books, uh, John Lennox. John Lennox is a prolific writer on this topic and he is all over the internet. Um, debating um, Richard Dawkins and, and people uh, and other atheists. Uh, Geisler and Turek. Turek is, uh, I'm not familiar with Geisler, Geisler, but I am with Turek. 
uh, they both wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And I urge everybody to buy this book, buy a hard copy of this book. It's very, very accessible in what it has to, to say. It reveals what is happening in the debate. Um, and they're quite funny. So they employ some kind of sense of humor to kind of ease the pain of having to read through this. Of course, uh, Lee Strobel is a very important voice. He's written a number of books called The Case For. In this a presentation, I'm looking at The Case For a Creator. And <clears throat> it's not within the scope of this presentation to talk about Philip Johnson. Uh, Philip Johnson wrote a book called Darwin on Trial, and he really um, caused a, a lot of ripples in the atheistic uh, world and it's a very significant book. It's very dense, very difficult to understand at some points. He's much more accessible as a speaker. You can find him on YouTube and listen to what he has to say. Um, a background for evolution, just a kind of a historical um, understanding of it. Uh, thinkers have speculated about evolution since ancient times. The ancient Greeks certainly thought about ev evolution. They were certainly thinking about the material world uh, very, very carefully. So evolution did not begin with Darwin. It wasn't a brand new idea that Darwin gave birth to. It has always existed, just like atheism has always existed. Uh, Darwin's contribution was to look for a mechanism that would explain um, how this evolutionary process happened. So, and that mechanism had to be purely materialistic. It had to get rid of God. It had to get rid of an intelligent designer. It had to get rid of a creator. So um, what, he, what he talked about is a fully materialistic theory to explain every complex characteristic or a major transformation um, by cumulative steps. So if you think about it, that you start with a one-celled amoeba and that one-celled amoeba goes through these uh, very grand transformations. It's a step-by-step -step process, almost like a snail at, at a snail pace. Um, a person that took kind of issue with this dogmatic gradualism is Stephen Jay Gould, who is an atheist and a materialist himself, but he argued, what good is 5% of an eye? And when he asked this question, Richard Dawkins said, well, 5% of vision is better than 0% of vision, but that's not what Gould was talking about. He wasn't talking about a fully formulated human eye that gave 5% of vision. He was talking about the step in which the species only had 5% of the eye developed. And he asked, what good would that be? Exactly like when you think about uh, the development of wings, so what good is half a wing? How does that serve a species? So that certainly um, uh, is something to take into consideration. Micro and macro evolution, um, the distinction is really quite crucial. Atheists don't like to make a distinction or materialists don't like to make a distinction between micro and macro. And why? Because microevolution is something that we can, it's, it has empirical evidence. We can see it um, happening in the world around us, but it's, it's variation within a prescribed limit. For example, if you think about dog breeders, uh, breeders can breed really tiny dogs like the Chihuahua, or they can breed really huge dogs, but there has never been a point in time when their ability to breed has turned a dog into an elephant because the variation can happen, but within the limits of that, that species. And we certainly see that in the world around us. So the, the, the materialist would say, because we have evidence uh, for microevolution, that means we have evidence for macroevolution. It just happens that way. But that's, that is something that really needs to be looked at closely. You can't make that leap from micro to macro. That's where the issue really lies. Because if there is no intelligent design and no intelligent designer behind all created things, um, and life uh, started with this one celled amoeba, this common ancestor. So they're saying that through millions and millions of years, this one cell has undergone changes that have led to the variety of all the plants we see, 
uh, on Earth today, all the animals that we see on Earth today, and certainly um, the human being as he, as he exists today. And this process they claim to be uh, a blind natural process. So you need to explain how do you get from a one-celled amoeba to, um, to something much more complex that, 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 that has organs, for example, or example, or for example, the development of the eye. So what they postulate is this mechanism that drives this macroevolutionary process called natural selection. Well, we need to see what natural selection really means. Everybody has heard of the phrase survival of the fittest. So natural selection is really about uh, survival of the fittest. So Dawkins argues that natural selection really accounts for the form and existence of all living things. If you wanna understand all living things, you have to understand that they came about through this natural selection. He, at the same time, he rejects that evolution has occurred by pure chance. He doesn't like this idea of accident. Yes, it's an unguided process. It's a natural process, but he's saying that there is a law-like process um, in there. So he seems to be arguing that natural laws, for example, uh, he calls natural selection a law, or if we think about the law of gravity, he's basically saying that these laws have creative power. And this is not, uh, there's no evidence that, for example, gravity can create anything. We can explain gravity. We don't even really have a clear understanding of what gravity itself really is or what energy really is. We can just um, uh, see their effect in the world. Natural selection is really more of a weeding process. It works on what already exists. It does not cause anything to come into creation. Natural selection has no creative power whatsoever. Think about having a garden where you're growing your prized flowers and you need to go into that garden and you need to weed it. You need to take out the weeds that are stealing the nutrients uh, from the soil away from your prized fl uh, flowers. Well, that weeding process um, is done by someone who is intelligent. You are working on the material world and you're taking out what is harmful, keeping in what is useful. If the process of evolution is very blind and it has no intelligence behind it uh, at all, so the very term selection becomes a questionable term because selection presupposes intelligence. Um, it's intelligent beings or intelligent minds that are capable of, of, uh, of selecting, doing natural selection. Um, so we need to look for proof for uh, the macro evolution um, by looking at the fossil record. So we begin with Darwin. Darwin had a great doubt. They call it Darwin's doubt. What happened with when Darwin um, presented his theory of evolution, it was paleontologists that had a really big problem with his theory. It wasn't the church. The church didn't mind what he had to say. It's the scientists themselves that said, we don't see any transitional form in the fossil record. There's nothing in the fossil record to indicate that this macro evolution actually, actually happens. Darwin himself felt uh, uneasy about the whole thing because he said that there should be quite a lot of evidence in the fossil record to support this kind of idea. But he um, hinged this theory on a hope that in the future, as more and more fossils are collected, that they would be able to see this intermediate or transitional, transitional form. What actually ended up happening is we, we find from David Ropp, who the Museum of Natural History, he says that we now, uh, 120 years later, we are in a possession of a quarter million uh, fossil species, and there is no evidence for transitional form or intermediate varieties. The fossil uh, record in no way supports um, the Darwinian's theory of evolution. In fact, what they do find in the fossil record is that the fossil species is st uh, stasis. That means there's no change. There is absence of change in the fossil record. 
most species exhibit no directional change in the fossil record. They appear in the fossil record fully formed and they, as they appear, they become extinct in the same way. They disappear in the same way. They, they do find in the fossil record this sudden appearance um, of, of, uh, in the Cambrian explosion, they call it the biological Big Bang, where the sudden appearance of species fully formed, they come, they are found to be fully formed, no evidence whatsoever of any kind of transitional or intermediate, intermediate variety. We hear from Stephen Jay Gould, things that are really very important, we need to be paying attention to. Stephen Jay Gould is a materialist, he is an atheist, but he tells us that the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. Paleontologists keep this as a secret and we have to ask why the secret? Um, he further says that our strong biases for gradual and continuous change forces us to, and it forces them to do uh, many, many things. And one of them is not to talk about how the fossil record really is, is very weak when it comes to supporting this kind of a very elaborate um, theory. We also hear from a, his fellow paleontologist, Niles Eldridge of the American Museum of Natural History. He says that when you see the introduction of evolutionary novelty, so you see an, a, like a new species comes into, um, uh, it usually shows up as a bang. It shows up as something fully formed. He further says that we paleontologists have said that the history of life supports the story of gradual adaptive change, knowing all the while that it does not. There seems to be some level of deception in that they, they present the fossil record to be, um, to be offering all of this support for this uh, theory when in fact they themselves are admitting that it, it, doesn't do, it doesn't do the job. Again, we hear from Henry Gee, he's a chief science writer for Nature. He says, to take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis. He calls it, it's more like a bedtime story. It's funny, but it is not scientific. Another very important person to look at is Pierre Grasset of the Sorbonne in France. He's a very, very eminent biologist and he rejects new Darwinism uh, wholeheartedly. In his book um, written in French here, which is The Evolution of Life, uh, he uh, levels a frontal attack on all kinds of Darwinism. The purpose of the book is to destroy the myth of evolution, which is a mystery uh, he claims about which little is known and perhaps can ever be known. We have um, many, many uh, paleontologists, scientists, biologists that are um, saying that there is nothing to substantiate um, this, this type of evolutionary plot process. Um, Turek and, Turek and Geisler say the fossil record actually lines up better with supernatural creation than macroevolution. Indeed, if you read Genesis 1 and you look at the story of creation um, and you, it's, it, the Cambrian explosion substantiates um, the coming on of species as, as fully formed. Um, then um, a, uh, materialists talk about genetic relatedness, and this is a very significant um, area of, um, uh, that needs to be looked at. So they look at similarities in DNA. Of course, DNA is another area that has to be talked about uh, quite, um, uh, quite uh, carefully, but they see similarities in D DNA sequence and it demonstrates to them without the doubt the intimate genetic relatedness of all living things. So because they believe that the DNA shows that all living things have this genetic relatedness, therefore we can pla place them on a common um, ancestral uh, tree, like the tree, uh, Darwin's tree of life, where you start with uh, the amoeba at the bottom and then the tree branches until it reaches the human being. Um, however, 
It is not evident that all living things evolved from the same ancestor. So apes and human beings share 98% of their DNA. And that has led them to conclude that therefore apes and human beings have a common ancestor. Um, but apes and human beings, for example, do not have any resemblance to snakes or fungus or trees. So there isn't this uh, similarity in, in all living things. Um, you have to explain the dissimilarity. And I think in much of the literature and many of the arguments, the dissimilarity is ignored. Uh, the 2% that differentiates us between apes is a very, very significant 2% because um, apes remain apes and human beings remain human beings. Um, and so looking at the 2% is not something that should ever be ignored. It's exactly like the argument that all religions preach love. So why do you claim that Christianity has any kind of uh, uh, uniqueness to it? Well, yeah, religions may be preaching uh, love and that may be a similarity, but you've got to take a look at all the dissimilarities between them to be able to ascertain exactly what it is that you're talking about. It cannot be, cannot be ignored. Um, important to look at Dawkins because Dawkins is like the god of materialism. He says that if you meet someone who doesn't believe in evolution, but he doesn't explain which kind of evolution he's referring to, then you know that the person is, his words, ignorant, stupid, or insane. Why is Dawkins so insulting? Um, why, do you, why does he have this need to resort to a verbal attack? Is Dawkins really so naive not to know that there are many brilliant scientists today that exist today, forget about those who existed in the past and have, have been awarded Nobel prizes um, in, in the work they have done in the science field that are very devout theists that are very devout Christians. Are they, because they reject um, macroevolution, not all evolution, are they ignorant and stupid and insane? Do, do their ignorance and stupidity and insanity kind of take a back seat when they enter their lab uh, to do their scientific work? And then when they exit, they become ignorant, stupid, insane people. It's, we have to be very careful, especially as young people, that when somebody levels an attack in a conversation that where you should be employing reason and logic and rationality and admitting ignorance when ignorance exists, when a person resorts to mockery and insult, you know right away that this person comes from a very weak position. They're trying to take you off balance. Don't allow people to ever do that to you, not even someone as um, a, a great scientist like Dawkins or, or, or his like. What do the science books teach? The science books, in the schools today, you're not allowed to talk about creationism. They will um, they crucify you at the stake. So the only thing that you can teach is materialism. So what is being taught? What is in the science books that is pushing that idea into the consciousness of young um, students of science to believe in materialism and not even dare to question it. So one thing the science books are still, so the literature says, are still uh, claiming is the Stanley Miller experiment. The Stanley Miller experiment was an experiment that is supposedly um, was successful to explain the origin of life. And in fact, it wasn't successful at all because Stanley Miller was not able to uh, create the same environment that would have existed at the inception of the origin of life. So it, it, it failed. Um, another thing that they have in the science book is Darwin's tree of life. Sorry, they, thank you. But the fossil record shows that this is a colossal failure. The, the, the fossil record does not in any way support Darwin's tree of life. 
Look at Ernest Haeckel's drawings of embryos. So he, in the textbooks, they line up all these embryos from different species. They say, look at how they all look so similar. Therefore, they all have a common ancestor, which is not true. Uh, the Archaeopteryx, uh, the half bird and half reptile, they've used this as um, an evidence for this transformational or transition period, it's proven to be false. It is just merely a bird. Uh, Richard Lenski from Michigan State University, he's a micro microbiologist. He conducted the largest laboratory evolution experiment on E. coli. And his experiment uh, tested 30 generations, which were equal to, would be what would be equal to 1 million years of human life. And at the end of this really elaborate experiment, what he ended up with was no new organism evolved. He ended up with E. coli, what he started out with. Uh, the peppered moth story um, is a very, uh, very popular story written in scientific books. And Michael, um, from a, a Cambridge expert on moths, uh, showed that the peppered moth story is not true. They, they were maintaining that these moths rested on tree trunks in the wild. In fact, they, they don't rest on tree trunks, they rest on the top of the actual trees in the branches themselves. So the peppered moth did not uh, prove evolution, does not prove evolution. And then they look at the finch beak length, again, proof of evolution. Um, the beak length really um, uh, did not show any kind of uh, change. It just actually supports uh, microevolution, not macroevolution. And then we see that there was a fossil find in Canada. I'm gonna pronounce it Tiktaalik. Uh, they hailed it as the missing link between fish and land vertebrates. But then in 2010 in Poland, there was a fossil footprint of tetrapods that, that actually came on the scene 10 million years before the Tiktaalik, so that failed. Uh, the Pilt Down Man Fossil, so there's this Man Fossil and Lucy, they present the, uh, equally the same kind of problem. Uh, so this Pilt Down Man Fossil was a paleontropological fraud um, in which bone fragments were presented as the fossilized remains of previously unknown early human beings. We see this problem in Lucy. Um, Lucy has been hailed as the intermediate between ape and man. They still talk about Lucy as the intermediate between ape and man, but we see that paleontologists themselves are discrediting this, and they're saying that um, the way Lucy was assembled, there was a bias to have her serve that purpose. So the, all the different fossil fragments that they found, they assembled it to present Lucy as the intermediate between men and ape. Very interesting story in 1981, the British Museum of Natural History wanted to present or did present an exhibition to, um, for a visitor to kind of go through the Darwinian theory of evolution. However, some of the literature that they were um, using at that time for this exhibit kind of didn't really um, give the impression that this is 100% a proven theory. And um, the scientists uh, didn't like that and they leveled quite an aggressive attack against the museum. And I think they suffered some kind of a financial setback due to that. So in 1981, they uh, presented the Darwinian theory of evolution as being totally non-controversial. You walk into this museum a theist, and as you exit, you exit as an atheist. Um, so uh, we read that just about everyone who took a college, college here in the US means university biology course during the last 60 years or so has been led to believe that the fossil record was a bulwark, that's a word for strength of support for the classic Darwinian the thesis and not a liability that had to be explained away. Um, so the books themselves are pushing uh, this idea that the fossil record is so, so powerfully, um, is powerfully proving 
this theory of evolution when in fact it's nothing, it, it's not. Stephen Stanley, a paleontologist explained that the doubts of paleontologists about gradualistic evolution were for many, many years suppressed. This idea of suppressing um, information in science is not something new. Um, if you read about brain plasticity, um, for, for many, many decades, any scientist that wrote um, in any scientific journal uh, about brain plasticity was ostracized and um, aggressively attacked um, um, because they didn't want to accept that the brain um, is, is, has plasticity. So it took many, many decades of uh, people who had the strength of character to really oppose the scientific field and use their evidence to prove uh, brain plasticity. So what's happening here with the fossil record is not something unique. It's happened before in the history of science. So I invite you for very important food for thought. Uh, why do scientists claim evolution is proven when in fact it isn't? And we're talking about macroevolution. When you engage in a conversation about evolution and somebody says to you, uh, do you believe in evolution or what is your opinion of evolution? Your first question should always be, what kind of evolution are you talking about? Are we talking about micro? Yeah, we don't have a problem with that. Are we talking about macro? And if you are, then the onus really is on you to prove to me that there is anything to substantiate it. Do you as an individual, as a student, blindly accept what teachers and professors say and why not question what they have to say? Don't ever think that uh, when a scientist says evolution is proven, uh, Darwin is proven, we live in a purely materialistic world, that, uh, that the final, the final uh, thought has been expressed. No, um, the, these people make mistakes. They are easily duped like us by looking at um, what scientists want to reveal to us and what they don't want to reveal to us. So I ask you, if you walk into a forest and after hours of walking in this jungle, you come upon this beautifully manicured garden, do you automatically say to yourself, oh, I'm sure it came about by an unguided process? Or do you automatically think, mm, I'd love to meet the gardener um, that designed this magnificent uh, place and I, I, and I want to see how he upkeeps it. Um, Johnson asks a very important question. If there are so many problems with Darwinism and no satisfactory alternative within the framework of Darwinism of evolution, why not reevaluate the framework? What makes our scientists so absolutely certain that everything really did evolve from simple beginnings? Why? And that's a really very important question. I want you to know that the God of the Bible enjoins us to search for truth. He doesn't want us to believe in him blindly because who would want that? He wants us to understand our world and our place in it. So are you taking this seriously or are you merely accepting or succumbing to what is said to you by what seem to be experts? Remember that experts are experts in a very particular field of study. They don't encompass every field of study. Don't allow people to rob you of your ability to think for yourself. The, the uh, thank God that we have people who uh, look at these issues and study them in an honest and unbiased way, as unbiased as a human being can, can be and offer us um, um, an alternative way of thinking about the world. If you are skeptic, if you, if you are experiencing doubt, that's a wonderful opportunity for you to say, I'm going to roll up my sleeves, I'm going to get down and dirty, and I'm going to search for truth, because that is the only meaningful thing that you can ever do uh, for your life. So my presentation today was to give you an overview of what is happening um, when it comes to the theory of evolution. It's a very complex things, uh, thing to talk about. Um, uh, 
uh, and I urge people to go on YouTube and listen to the experts and what they have to say, listen to the debates, uh, look at, uh, listen to the questions that are being asked. I just hope that this uh, short presentation has given, what is able to give you food for thought and to encourage you to uh, look into this um, worldview a little bit more closely. Uh, God willing, uh, next session, if there is a next session, I'm going to take the opportunity to look at all the evidence available for uh, the truth of the Bible. We'll focus on the New Testament and a different session we will focus on how God is characterized in the Old Testament. And uh, we look for proof for the resurrection of Christ on which many of these debates uh, really hinges. Did Christ really resurrect? Because if he didn't, then Christianity is not something we should be talking about. Thank you for listening and um, see you next time.